For the month of May, the Sacramento History Museum has focused on the old Sacramento Historical District, the historic and not so historic buildings, spaces that were there and what are they being used for now. Uh, we're talking about his very historic buildings. This is an extra Facebook Live, and we're going to take a close look at the architecture of the, of the, the uh, district. Uh, this is inspired by a, an incident that happened about five years ago at the Sacramento History Museum, in which a man came to the front desk. He was visiting, and he said, what's with the arches? He explained that he had spent his entire career in the oil business in Tripoli, Libya, and he said if he just looked a certain way, he'd swear he was in Tripoli with the predominance of arches. And so that led to this talk. Now, I could yammer and stammer and stumble and not do a, a service to anybody, so I thought it best to get somebody here who knows what he is talking about, and so I am excited to invite William Berg, to this talk. William is a architectural historian with the California State Parks Office of Historic Preservation. You probably know him because you have him on his, your bookshelf because he has written several books about Sacramento, including uh, the, the streetcars of Sacramento, the post-war renaissance, and when before this was old Sacramento, this was known as West, the West End, and Wicked Sacramento talks about the politics and cultural clash and the colorful figures who inhabited the West End. So William's here to help us. I'm going to stand in for you and be the visitor who doesn't know what he's talking about because that's not a hard act for me to uh, pretend. And William, tell us about the architecture of this city, which began as a rough and tumble gold rush city and then evolved. And so how did that play out in terms of what the buildings looked like? Well, the early architecture of Sacramento uh, after thousands of years of use by the Nissanon was an improvised instant city. And so people used whatever materials they had at hand, canvas and wood, to throw up a very immediate and very flimsy town. And so buildings like the Eagle Theater, wood frame building with canvas, were among the early examples. There's really not any architectural style to it because the idea is just a protective covering. But as soon as cities are born, the people who live there want to show them off, which means there's an emphasis on, have, on having a more high style architecture. The 1850s was the end of the era for what's called Greek Revival architecture. Some of the oldest buildings in the Sacramento area had this style, and the Tehama Block is an example of commercial Greek Revival based, as you can imagine from the name, on ancient Greek temples. It was also inspired by Greek inspiration of democracy of which America was a new democracy, and we wanted to show off our political heritage with that architectural style. But the thing about these buildings, canvas and wood, is that they're highly flammable, and they float away during floods. And like the big bad wolf did the first two little pigs' house, they blew the houses down and then burned them down. So we needed architecture that was both decorative, attractive, sturdy and resistant to this city's tendency to burn down and flood. <laughs> so about 1854, the city required all new buildings to be constructed of brick. And so we see more of it to the right here with the uh, Brandon building and the Vernon Brandon building behind it. All right, so the, the Eagle Theater, get a roof over people's heads, get them in shelter. Greek Revival, more sophisticated, and you were saying that this is really a reflection of the people in power who came here. They brought this, they started to bring this, these styles with them. Yes, most of Sacramento's European-American inhabitants in the 1850s came from the Northeast, so New England and New York, and they brought the architectural styles of their era with them. Greek Revival was going out of style, and a new style, Italian, it was starting to take over. That's where you see buildings like these from the 1850s, 1860s, all the way up through the 1880s. Here's where I get to ask you, William, what's with the arches? I mean, I think they're hard, but you're explaining these are not common, but these are standard yes, it's a architectural elements. It's a feature of architecture. The person you mentioned from Tripoli, Italy is a Mediterranean country. So is Libya. And the architecture of the Mediterranean was inspired by the architecture of the ancient world, not just the Greeks, but the cultures that came after them. The Romans, 
the uh, architecture of the Muslim world through North Africa and all the way into Spain and throughout Europe was inspired by classical precedents but using different materials. And an arch is a naturally strong way to build. Instead of a, a, just a single wooden beam across the top, all the stress is hitting the center of that beam and so it's more likely to collapse. An arch, the keystone at the top of the arch instead of going straight down, it depends on the strength of the adjacent bricks. And so you have this whole pillar of brick holding up the arch. So it's strong, it's simple, it's repeatable, and it's pretty. So you get all of this in one architectural style. And that's where the Italian buildings of Old Sacramento stood out. Would it be fair to say that there's uh, an amount of foresight in that if you're saying that the beams are not as structurally sound but the arches are that they were thinking in terms of longevity in terms thinking of in terms of longevity and strength but also economy there are ways around that if you want to just have a sim single lintel you can have a giant a piece of stone of marble or or granite but that's more expensive than brick bricks cheap you can make it right here in sacramento instead of having to bring it down from folsom on a on a wagon train or on the early railroad so it's an accessible material that costs less and it sounds like one thing led to another as the city was re going to brick because of the fire damage and luckily enough had all these clay deposits around the community now they can make the brick and now they had the luxury of building that way yeah. well, anywhere you've got a river you've got clay so you've got this nice clay soil. You had a big clay pit in uh, roughly where Southside neighborhood is today. And uh, a massive need for bricks. And now we're, you mentioned uh, that the, the arches are strong and, and they look pretty. So you've got show and go going on at the same time. You've got the decoration, but the structural soundness. And now this building, the Booth building represents yet another era of Sacramento's power, wealth, stability. Maybe we could go over here and get a good look at the Booth Building mm -hmm. and you can describe what's, what's going into play and how right. well, Sacramento's Booth, evolution. As, as an early California governor and business person, he wanted prominence. And this was right where people got off the riverboat from San Francisco if they were coming around first arriving in Sacramento and then where they got off the trains all in the same point. And so the first thing they see, the first impression that visitor gets of Sacramento is what they get when they step off the train or step off the boat. And that's what Booth wanted to project. He also, as you know, wanted to be able to communicate with riverboats down, down the river a ways to negotiate a price. So he needed something tall, but he also needed something pretty. And that's where Italian it really shines because the full force Italian it looks more like a wedding cake that you can live in. You've got the arches on the windows, but also you have decorations, you have depth, you have a cornice line along the top, and underneath the, you the can... Stop, stop for yes. a second, William, explain that to us for what, what the cornice line... Right. Yeah. The cornice line, as you can see, there's essentially it's a, a projecting line a, a, near the top of the building, and directly underneath it, you have a variety of different architectural details holding it up. These could be called dentals, or modillions, or... Um, or eave brackets, or there, there are a variety of different descriptions for what all are basically work out the same thing. In this case, we have a row of corbels and uh, directly underneath the cornice line. And then beneath that, you've got uh, the windows and you've got both. You, they, they, the, if you, you go to a restaurant, you order one with everything. That window, each window of the booth building is one with everything. It has an arch. It has a sill above it. There are decorative moldings above and below each window. So it's all about depth and detail. And when the sun hits a design like that, it casts these interesting shadows. And you see that a lot in San Francisco architecture where it's very foggy and cloudy and gray. Uh, there's a whole lot of Italian adept architecture that has a lot of depth, so it casts shadows. Sacramento, we've got lots of bright light, so the shadows are even more pronounced. And so you can create a really interesting visual display just through architecture. Uh, another thing, in front of the, 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 uh, the windows, you have a two-story cover over the sidewalks, creating a, shaded, a shade. So you're shading people walking down the street, so it, it has function. 
you're shading people on the second story. So it's still more function. They want to come out for ventilation, but it also has form. People wanted to see high tech in their buildings and high technology in this era with the steam era. So you have, if you have a steam powered lathe, you can carve these very high tech looking for the 1850s and 60s turned posts. And that's what holds up the, both the original and, and second level porches on these buildings. And the, the, more, the more detailed, the more elaborate, the better, because it meant you had the money to pay for it. If you're looking for a restaurant, you're not going to be impressed by a shack anymore. Right. Sacramento went from, in five years, from being a frontier town to being the capital of the state California and the origin point for the first railroad in the western United States. So they wanted to show some class, right. and Governor Booth definitely wanted <laughs> to show off what he had to offer. So we typically think of the weekend train and the Delta King as evoking the age of steam, but you're saying these buildings, if you look hard at them, you, this is the age of steam in, in the construction. They the all do, from, from the, the river boats and the steam railroads to the steam-powered lathes that built these high-tech materials to show off the city. Now you mentioned the, the shadows and the, and the light that uh, is produced from this architecture. You said that some architects were lured to Sacramento as a result of the gold rush. That seems like some very uh, long range thinking, but you say a lot of these buildings weren't necessarily built or designed by architects, but by builders who knew what they were doing. Just your typical mason knew how to design an arch, knew how to do the basics that were necessary. And sometimes buildings would get spruced up and new additions were made over time. If you look at commercial buildings today, after 10 or 15 years, they look a little dated. So people will add new details to keep up with architectural style. In fact, when old Sacramento was developed, the West End had this whole agglomeration of another century of architectural styles and very often uh, a lot of later architectural styles that had been applied to these buildings whether they were uh, Victorian style designs like uh, Queen Anne uh, bay windows are not what you'd find in the 1860s but they were all over downtown Sacramento in some cases they were taken off and brought back restored to the 1860s condition so Yes, there were architects that came out here. Typically, a lot people of every profession came out here. Some just happened to be architects. Or they thought they could find work because there's a new city and you're going to need architecture at some point. In the meantime, who knows, maybe I'll find gold. I don't know how many architects found gold, but plenty of them found careers after the gold rush, building the cities of Sacramento and San Francisco and Stockton and Marysville and so on. So as the, the West End approached the 20th century, there was a mishmash of architecture sometimes going on in the same building. Uh, with this return to the historic district, was there a cleaning up that went on, a kind of a, a taking back to the Italian uh, style? There are several different methods. We were talking about treating historic buildings one way or another. A lot of our historic districts in Sacramento are a wide variety of architectural styles. They're like a Whitman sampler. So you've got a brand new building next to a, a 1950s building next to a 1900s building. Old Sacramento was developed during an era when people were much more interested in creating an impression of a particular era. And so they, would, they, they did a restoration approach where they took back the style to a particular point and then in some cases demolished buildings that were they considered too new and built reconstructions. That's why a large proportion of the buildings here are reconstructions to reflect a certain era to project a certain environment versus the city's historic districts on the other side of I-5 that have a wide variety of architecture including mid-century modern architecture. Now I, uh, I noticed that the, uh, I don't know if that's the cornice above the veranda there above that porch on Boost building is the uh, the squares the repeated squares and I've noticed that motif on many buildings including the Hastings building and what the Democratic State Journal building which is not really the, the way it looks is that what is that and is that a common I mean along along the roof yeah along the along the roof line you see right here at the top of the the the, the yes. Brennan's building and the Booth building are those repeated uh, square shapes well those are smokestacks no, 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 not those. Yeah, I, I, let's go for it. Yeah, let's explain that because uh, I, I, I totally lose yeah. sight of that. I'm talking right at the top of the of the porch there. You see the small square repeated motif going on. 
All right, that's essentially a repetition of the cornice line in okay. simplified wooden form. Okay. Those are uh, sometimes they're called dentils or medallions, depending on the the, the way that they're arranged. But that uh, that's uh, what's sometimes called a dentilated cornice. A dental, as in teeth. Oh, really? Okay. Yes, except D I D E N T I L, not A L. But De that it's the same. Decorative, root word, structural, same root or word. Both. It's decorative. Okay. Okay. Now go to the smokestacks because right. we walk past these and we don't even think about the smokestacks. Yeah. Well, Sacramento, as it, like I said, it's it's a hot city. It's a Mediterranean climate city, and so a lot of the same responses to climate that you'd see in a Mediterranean place you see here in Sacramento. Now, there's no air conditioning. There's no electricity. So how do you keep a place like this warm and cool? You keep it warm by having a lot of small fireplaces rather than a central fireplace and just smoke up the whole building, but small fireplaces throughout the building to heat individual rooms. And a 19th century building is its kind of like a sailing ship. It's manually operated. You open windows and close them and close off different parts of rooms that you want to heat or cool. And in the summer, that is that smokestack effect. It's, it's called the stack effect because hot air rises. And in the summer, the coolest area is by the ground. And part of why the ceilings are so high in a lot of these buildings is because you're down here and the heat's up there. And if you arrange the building properly, the heat can keep going out the roof of the building, which actually creates a little bit of suction to draw in the cool air from the basements, which as we know in old Sacramento are hollow. You put some vents there, you've got a constant flow of passive cooling air, zero electricity. It's green design. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I appreciate knowing, uh, learning that kind of information. And we are going to take a closer look in just a minute at the arches and the doorknobs and address some questions. We get a lot at the museum. But I'm glad we went here because I get it occasional to take this personally because I get sometimes a chance to play a real Scotsman who owned that building next to Booth's Booth. So he was Thomas Leggett. He had an alehouse there. And I described it as looking somewhat like a wedding cake with a lot of decorative uh, decorative things going on and you explained that that is still an Italianate building at the core, correct? Yes, very much an Italianate building. They didn't always have arched windows, it was just very common. But the other features of Italianate architecture, the really complex one with everything windows, the cornice lines, the architectural details, the turned posts, and then even on this building you've got multiple layers of corbels. You've got corbels on the top, you've got corbels underneath the the, the windows, and you've got corbels on the ground floor, the pillars of the, of the entrance. So everywhere where he could put a decorative element, he did. And yes, he wanted to show off this cool style of beverage, ale. It was the Sacramento's <laughs> first ale house, as opposed to lager or other styles of beer. And uh, Scot Scotsmen were a relatively small proportion of the local brewers, which were mostly German, so right. we wanted to show off some Scottish style right, and right. had to have something that wasn't like anything else. And because there was a lot of competitiveness, there wasn't a central design bureau in Sacramento that says, you shall use these styles. It was a bunch of people who were all competing with each other for the attention of the people getting off the boats and getting off the trains. Yeah. And so he, his, you'll notice his building's a little bit bigger than Booth's, <laughs> just so he can kind of look down on Booth and say, oh yeah? You yeah, think I, your place is fancy. I posited that that's what's going on. He's got a small building. He's got a, he's a David competing against Goliath. But you also say that Thomas Leggett had a fiscal advantage to that narrow space, tall building. Well, one reason why a lot of 19th century buildings are narrow is not only because in a walking city, it's advantageous to have a lot of use of vertical space and that stack effect, but also the tax person came around and they charged you based on the width of your lot. So a narrow building paid smaller taxes. Yeah, he's a smart one. He's a smart one. We are going to go an answer those uh, museum visitors' questions about the archways and the doorknobs. We are going to risk our lives crossing Front Street. If we don't make it, William, Allie, who's running the camera and producing the show, is really good knowing you. So let's, let's, let's try to make it across. Look both ways, kids. So we were, I was suggesting that we look at the archways on the, uh, this building here, but you mentioned that the windows are out of historic, they're not yes. historically. The, these windows, you find them a lot in old Sacramento, but this sort of oval style window is not really a historic style. It's more of a, a fanciful interpretation that was applied 
in the 70s. So lovely buildings, just not going to work for our discussion right at this moment. But the question we get a lot, and you alluded to the a bit, uh, William, is uh, what's with the high ceilings and what's with the low doorknobs? Or well, we talked a little bit about hot air rising, and if if you're uh, actually the, okay, what was the name? Please remind me of the name of the owner of this building. Oh, to Thomas. Oh, this. Oh, Newton Booth. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, Newton Booth. All right. Okay. Well, Newton Booth, and, and the one next door. <laughs> Uh, Thomas Leggett. Thomas Leggett. He yeah. was, I understand, I, I forgot his name, but I know he was quite a talker. He loved to spin a yarn. <laughs> and so there's a lot of hot air in that building. You want to let it rise out. So you need tall doors. Also, once again, no electricity, nothing but candlelight or oil lamps to light it, uh, light it up. So a big window meant that you get lots of natural sunlight. It also meant the hot air could raise, could come out. It also created that monumentality of space. You walk in and it's like you're walking into a cathedral because there's a lot of vertical space above you. And so you have a, a cathedral of ale right here and a cathedral of business <laughs> right next to it. Then the low doorknobs. The low doorknobs, probably because people were generally shorter. You know, I looked that up, and I, I, and this goes to the other question I was going to. Statistically, they, it takes you know a long time for humans to get tall, taller, shorter. But one theory I've heard is that the high ceilings and the low doorknobs are both designed to stretch a perspective and convey this feeling of power and grandeur. Step into my business and be impressed. <laughs> Certainly could. Yeah. And then the other feature that you can see on the, the farthest left door are the steel shutters, which not only are there oh, yeah, for security, sticking. but also for fire protection. Remember, we started doing uh, brick buildings to limit fire damage, and steel shutters help prevent the wooden windows and doors underneath from catching fire. You might be able to answer this as an expert. How well did the steel shutter system work as far as fire deterrence? It was better than not having one. <laughs> And it did have a certain level of security sure, too. Sure, I guess so. so, yeah. Now, the green design that came before people were even thinking green design, is this repeated nowadays? In architecture, do people use these same techniques? Actually, up until World War II, buildings generally were more fuel efficient because fuel was more expensive. If you were heating your house with coal, you had to lug a coal bucket up there. You didn't necessarily have electricity. Gas lighting was relatively weak. So anywhere you can get the most, the most light for your buck, you'd take advantage of it. And it's only really since the advent of green building requirements and new green materials in the 21st century that are we building finally buildings that are as efficient as the ones that we built 150 years ago. Now is this a function, are these green designs, are they applicable just about anywhere or is it especially helpful to a, what's essentially a northern Mediterranean climate? There are different responses for different places. On the east coast you find more construction of stone and more party walls where you have homes that are built next to each other sharing a common wall. So heat is not lost between the walls of the house. In Sacramento, not so much in old Sacramento, but in the historic neighborhoods, row houses, instead of being adjacent with each other to share heat in a cold winter, they have space between them to allow the breezes to pass through and to plant trees to shade them in a hot summer. So it's very much a, a site-specific environmental response. Uh, the Nissanon, who had been here for thousands of years, knew that it flooded perfectly well, so they built reed houses that they could reconstruct very easily using materials immediately at hand. And when Europeans arrived, they built a, an adobe fort, which was massive and held in heat, absorbed heat during the day, and then radiated it out during, during the night. Again, a southwestern adaptation of green design. So, so it's a conscious paying attention of what came before, at least somewhat. Yeah, it's, it's, it's knowledge that's passed on the same yeah. way that Masons passed on how to build an arch. Right. It's part of the trade, part of the, the design rules. It's things that a lot of us forgot, even building trades, during the last half of the 20th century when it was assumed that atomic power will make electricity so cheap you won't even have an electric bill. <laughs> Turned out not to be the case. <laughs> So we're, we're relearning a lot of the lessons that our ancestors knew thousands of years ago. Now, would you rather have heard me stumble and bumble like I predicted I would, or would you rather have gotten the insights, tremendous insights? I'm going to go away with a lot more information about 
this town I'm trying to represent uh, in just in this minute, few minutes we've had. We've allowed, allowed William to go off with his mask and we've been standing six feet away. If you're wondering, he rocks the facial hair a lot better than I could anyway, so I'm leaving my mask on. William, thank you very much for this time that you have spent. And are there any questions? Does anybody have any questions, Facebook? They got it all. They got it all. Well, I'd, Thank you very much, and uh, you know, look forward to. I know that you probably got a book in mind coming coming sometime, and we look forward to it. We sell them in your store. Shameless plug. Um, oh, right. So yeah, thank you very much. And Ali is behind the camera. She produces these shows. Next Monday, the Museum Mondays Facebook Live is going to be about the secret parks in Old Sacramento, places that used to be buildings, and now we'll find out what they what they are. Thank you very much.